Welcome, everyone. Is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I know some of you are still in line uh, waiting to get lunch. Uh, there are plenty of chairs up here toward the front of the room, so please feel free to make your, make your way forward uh, as you grab something to eat. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our Capitol Hill briefing titled Saving Lives from Opioid Overdoses. My name is Jeff Vanderslice, and I am the Director of Government and External Affairs at the Cato Institute, a DC-based think tank dedicated to the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Cato's Hill briefings, you'll notice that today's format is a little bit different. We're going to start, of course, uh, with a robust policy discussion uh, on the effectiveness of naloxone and the effect of and reasons for the FDA's prescription requirement. Uh, but then we're going to shift gears uh, a bit, and uh, attendees uh, and our online viewers will both have the opportunity to witness a naloxone training conducted by the DC Department of Health. Uh, and those uh, of you who are present and who stay uh, through the duration of the event, uh, uh, the department will distribute Narcan, a nasal spray version of naloxone to anybody uh, who, who wishes to take it with them. Uh, joining us for part one of today's discussion uh, are two scholars, both of whom happen to be medical doctors. Um, the first, Dr. Jeffrey Singer, is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute where he works in the Department of Health Policy Studies. Dr. Singer is principal and founder of Valley Surgical Clinics, the largest and oldest group private med uh, surgical practice in Arizona where he still practices medicine today. He joined Cato on a full-time basis in 2017 where he writes and speaks extensively on both regional and national public policy with a specific focus on the areas of healthcare policy and the harmful effects of drug prohibition. He received his BA from Brooklyn College and his MD from New York Medical College. He is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, also joining us is Cato adjunct scholar and Georgetown University professor of law, David Hyman. A medical doctor as well as a lawyer, Professor Hyman most recently served as the Ross and Helen, Helen Workman Chair in Law and uh, Professor of Medicine at the University of Illinois, uh, where he directed the Epstein Program in Health Law and Policy. He focuses his research on the regulation and financing of healthcare and has taught insurance, medical malpractice, law and economics, uh, professional responsibility and tax policy in addition to civil procedure. Professor Hyman served as special counsel on the Free uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, and he has been a visiting law professor at the University of Texas and George Washington University, a law professor at the University of Maryland and a lecturer at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, Dr. Hyman earned his BA, JD and MD MD degrees from the University of Chicago. Uh, our panelists, just to give you a kind of a run of show for the day, our panelists will speak until approximately 12.30, at which point we'll have uh, about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and that will bring us to about 12.45, which will conclude uh, uh, the, the first portion of today's event. And we'll then turn it over to the DC Department of Health at 12.45 to uh, do the naloxone training. So with that, uh, Dr. Singer. Thank you. So, so um, I'm, I'm going to focus more on the medical science surrounding uh, naloxone, and then my colleague will get into some of the uh, issues surrounding making naloxone over the counter in, in more detail. So just uh, to, to get into the science, naloxone was actually originally developed in, in 1961 and was approved for use in 1971. So it's been used widely in this country and throughout the world for over 40 years, 50 years now. And um, it, uh, I just want to give a word about uh, opioid receptors. There are numerous opioid receptor sites within the brain and central nervous system. Um, the ones that we know the most about and seem to and seem to have the most uh, interaction with opioids are what we call the mu receptors from the Greek letter mu. That was chosen because M mu uh, for morphine. That's why it was chosen. There are actually three mu receptors, mu1 receptors, 
um, provide analgesia and physical dependence. Mu2 receptors provide respiratory depression, a euphoric feeling, and physical dependence. And then there's another uh, receptor discovered that's a mu receptor called mu3 receptors. It seems we're not, we don't know a lot about what, what that receptor does except maybe it dilates the blood vessels. But there are other receptors, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but there are delta receptors and kappa receptors. And there's a, uh, a type of receptor that we're learning more about called the nociceptin receptor, which might have something to do with the development of, of tolerance. Um, and the, uh, the way naloxone works is it binds with the mu receptors very strongly and displaces any opioid that is already bound to the receptor. But once it binds to that receptor, it doesn't do anything to affect the receptor in any other way except taking up the spot that was other would otherwise be occupied chemically by the opioid. So if a person has opioids in their system, the, the attraction to the, to the mu receptor by naloxone is so strong that it will actually displace an opioid that's on that receptor and take its place. Um, now, it, when it does that, it could stay bound on average for about two to eight minutes, depending. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it could reverse resp uh, respiratory depression with, within two to eight minutes after it's been given and can stay, stay bound uh, anywhere from a half hour to 90 minutes. And then it starts to let go, and if there's still circulating opioid in the system, you might have to give another dose. Um, nowadays, we're finding, according to the latest reports from the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2017, 40% of all overdose deaths contained fentanyl, and 75% of overdose deaths that were opioid related were either heroin or fentanyl, or both, 75%. Um, fentanyl is a very potent opioid, so sometimes it requires multiple administrations of uh, the naloxone to displace the fentanyl from the mu receptors because they're so much more powerful. Uh, and, and, and then finally, like I say, if, if it's lingering, lingering around longer, you may get the, the reversal of the respiratory depression, which is the way people die from an overdose, they stop breathing. You can get the reversal of that, but it may wear off and you have to do it again. The good thing about naloxone is it really is uh, otherwise essentially harmless. Uh, if, I, if I gave naloxone to anybody in this room who doesn't have any opioids in their system, you won't experience anything. When given orally, it's not uh, absorbed from the intestinal tract, which is why it's been combined with buprenorphine, which is used to treat uh, opioid use disorder. In, in combination, a pill, the original pill was called Suboxone, because uh, Subutex was buprenorphine without the, the, the naloxone. And the idea behind that was you, if you orally take uh, suboxone, the buprenorphine gets absorbed, binds incompletely with the opioid receptors enough to make you not go into withdrawal from opioid dependency and, and to not feel the need for more opioids. Uh, but the, the naloxone is just excreted in the gut. On the other hand, if you want to inject the naloxone by grinding, the suboxone by grinding up and, and, and injecting it, which, you know, some people might want to do, well, the naloxone will counteract the effect of the buprenorphine. That's, that's why they will put in combination together. Um, the quickest route of administration of naloxone is intravenous, which is the way it's usually done in the hospitals. Sometimes you'll see some, uh, particularly uh, an elderly person could be particularly sensitive to an opioid and, uh, they suddenly were, were monitoring them and their, their sat O2 saturation drops, their respiration rate drops. And usually the, the nursing staff knows if they, if even at the same time that somebody's calling the doctor to let the doctor know, they're already administering the naloxone intravenously because, like I said, it's not going to hurt them to get the naloxone. If it turns out that's not the, the reason why they're not breathing well, you didn't do any harm. But if that is the reason because of the, of the opioid in their system, you've rescued them. You don't want to waste time waiting for the doctor to call back. It also can be given in, intramuscularly, IM we call that, w through an auto-injector, very much like you know, the epinephrine, EpiPen kind of thing, um, and a nasal spray, which is very commonly used today. The usual dose, do adult dose intravenously is 0 0.4 milligrams to 2 milligrams. Uh, the auto-inject pen is just basically one injection. 
and the spray is one nasal spray, and if no response, repeat again in two to three minutes. Um, it, it can precipitate withdrawal symptoms, so if a person uh, is dependent on opioids and has the opioids, now I'm talking about physical dependency, because as you know, there's a difference between addiction and dependency. Uh, addiction is much less common than dependency, and dependency is a feature of many kind of drugs, uh, from opioids to antidepressants to tranquilizers to even beta blockers. So if anybody's been placed on a beta blocker, for example, for a heart arrhythmia or for high blood pressure, your doctor should tell you, don't stop this suddenly, talk to me because we have to gradually taper you off or you can go into a fatal withdrawal reaction. So that's dependency. Well, the same thing exists with opioids. So if a person has been chronically taking opioids for a chronic pain condition, for example, they've developed a physical dependency. That doesn't mean they're addicted. If you give them a nox, a naloxone, that could precipitate withdrawal symptoms. So that's important to know. Now, naloxone has been so effective in reversing overdoses that the World Health Organization includes it on its list of what they call essential medicines. Uh, in May of uh, 2018, Surgeon General Jerome Adams uh, issued an advisory touting the effectiveness of naloxone and encouraging its widespread use. Uh, the CDC in 2015 reported that at least 20, 26,500 overdoses that they were able to uh, document were reversed between the years 1999 and 2014. And then they noticed that when increased naloxone access began in the year 2010, overdose reversals during that time frame from 2010 to 2014, um, uh, increased more than two and a half times over preceding years. Um, a meta-analysis that was published in 2015 by researchers at Columbia University and, and NYU concluded that even making naloxone available to untrained bystanders significantly reduces overdose deaths. For this reason, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the American Medical Association, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy have all urged making naloxone more available. But naloxone is categorized by the Food and Drug Administration as a prescription-only drug. So in order to make it more available, all 50 states now have come up with workarounds. Uh, by definition, prescription-only means can only be available by a prescription from a healthcare practitioner licensed by the state. But the state legislatures have a lot of leeway regarding scope of practice and, and who, what kind of healthcare practitioners they're going to license and what they can do. So what many states have done is they've just uh, authorized pharmacists who are licensed healthcare practitioners to prescribe naloxone. So a person would have to come up to the, to the counter in a pharmacy and ask the pharmacist for naloxone. And a pharmacist can prescribe it. You don't have to go to a doctor for it. Uh, in many states, including my state of Arizona, they've come up with a different workaround. Our state uh, health, Department of Health director happens to be an MD, so she issued, and this is, I think this has become the majority now, she issued what's called a standing order, so uh, she's actually functioning as the physician and has is, is, is officially notified all pharmacists in the state of Arizona that if a person comes to you wanting naloxone, I'll be the prescribing doctor. You can go ahead and give it to them. You have my permission. So that, that's helped. But, um, uh, and, and preliminary data that we're getting now from the CDC uh, regarding overdose rates in 2018 suggests that overdose rates may be starting to level off. And it seems to be most notice, noticeable. The, the national numbers are lev leveling off, but some states, the, the numbers are still going up. In the states that have really put an effort into the widespread distribution of naloxone and made naloxone more readily available, those are the states that have had the, the most encouraging improvements. Ohio, for example, has had a significant uh, leveling off of overdoses, particularly in, in the Cuyahoga County around Cleveland, and that's uh, because of, of an actual uh, conscious effort to get naloxone more available to people, uh, with not just first responders, but uh, caregivers, and friends of people who uh, are using opioids. They also have expanded uh, needle exchange programs in the state, and most needle exchange programs distribute naloxone to the, to the uh, people receiving the, the new needles, so that, I'm sure that's contributed as well. Massachusetts is another example. Um, 
However, while making these, these workarounds by the states have been an improvement, um, it, it, studies have shown and data ha have shown that the, we could see much more improvement if naloxone was made completely over the counter, off the shelf, so that you can go into a, a pharmacy, let's say, get a box of Band-Aids off the shelf, box of, uh, a box of naloxone, and go to the checkout counter. Because there's been a, a, there have been a lot of reports of people who are, there's such a stigma attached now to people who are even on opioids for chronic pain or for acute pain. And I can tell you this because I, I, I practice surgery and I prescribe opioids for acute post-operative pain. And there's such a stigma attached now when, when, uh, to opioid use in general that when a patient goes up to the counter to fill their prescription for an opioid, uh, they almost feel ashamed. So because you need to go up to a pharmacist to ask for uh, naloxone, a lot of people are re hesitant to take advantage of that or to avail themselves of that. Uh, there are a, ha a handful of states that still actually also uh, pro prohibit prescriptions from being given out to third parties. So for example, if you have a, a close friend or loved one who uh, is on chronic uh, opioid treatment uh, or has an opioid use disorder and you'd like to have naloxone in, in, in your purse because you're afraid one day you'll come home and find your friend not breathing and you'd like to be able to resuscitate them, in certain states you can't get that prescription filled, only the person who's the actual patient can get the prescription filled. There are about five states left that have that rule. So that's standing in a way. Finally, um, there are a lot of pharmacists who uh, believe, they actually believe that uh, it is enabling someone to give out the naloxone and they don't want to help them with what they consider to be a, 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 a vice. Now I would say, you know, that kind of judgment I equate to if somebody is obese and has uh, high blood pressure as a result of their obesity and wants to fill their antihypertensive prescription, and a pharmacist saying, I don't want to fill your antihypertensive prescription because I'm just enabling you in your you know, poor eating lifestyle. I equate that the same way because opioid use disorder is an illness and uh, we shouldn't be moralizing, we should be treating. Um, there, it, along those lines, there was a, a National Bureau of Economic Research working paper that came out in, in uh, 2017 that suggested that there might be what economists call a moral hazard uh, by giving out naloxone. It might actually encourage people to use, to, to, uh, to use drugs non-medically. However, uh, another paper that same year came out in the journal Addictive Behavior by researchers at NYU and found, interestingly, no evidence of com what they call compensatory drug use. And in fact, uh, drug use actually declined among users after they were trained to use naloxone. Um, so here's the thing, if, if we, if we want to make naloxone available over the counter so we don't have to uh, deal with those issues. Oh, and finally, I have neglected to mention this, a lot of the people who we want to target, the people who are dying of overdoses are not the kind of people actually that walk into pharmacies and go up to the pharmacy counter. These are oftentimes people living on the streets. And uh, so we're not really getting enough naloxone to our target audience. Again, a reason to make it more available over the counter. In fact, I would like to see it available in vending machines because uh, I, like Plan B is often available in vending machines in a lot of universities because that way it's completely confidential and private. You, can, you don't even have to have the uh, person running the cash register when you check out looking at you like there's something wrong with you when you buy your box of Narcan. You can uh, just put your money in the machine, get your Narcan and leave and nobody has to know about it. So that would be ideal as far as I'm concerned. Now, the FDA recognizing that for years naloxone has been used by non-professionals, non-trained professionals, lay people, first responders, uh, they have felt that it's time, it's ripe, time to, to consider making naloxone over the counter. I should mention, Italy made naloxone over the counter in 1996 to overcome the problems I discussed. Australia in 2016 made naloxone over the counter for the same reason. So they've invited the, F, the, the, the manufacturers to request of them to petition that they reconsider making naloxone over the counter, and the manufacturers have not requested. As recently as December 2018, 
the FDA actually uh, issued a, a press release saying, we've done a lot of work for you manufacturers. We've taken the liberty of filling out the forms. In order for us to approve you for over-the-counter, we'd have to approve your labeling. We've actually done the research and we have model labeling, so we did all this work for you that, that we don't have to do. All we need you to do is request that we review this to make it over-the-counter. Uh, and so far that hasn't happened. The fact is, uh, as I've written and many others have written, uh, that's really not required under FDA regulations. That's one way. Another way is, according to the regulations quote, any interested person can request review for over-the-counter. Uh, the commissioner could just decide to make it over-the-counter. That's happened many times before. Back in the 90s, many cold remedies were made over-the-counter. And then at the end of the day, Congress could just decide to make it over-the-counter. Um, also, experience has shown us that when drugs move from uh, prescription status to over-the-counter status, prices drop dramatically. The same thing happened with cold remedies. That might be something behind why the manufacturers don't seem too anxious to request making uh, uh, naloxone over-the-counter. And that is the perfect segue into my colleague who's going to get into that. So thank you all for coming and uh, thank Jeff uh, for that excellent introduction uh, to the science uh, behind naloxone, the sort of uh, ground rules in some ways for uh, how it has historically been regulated and the opportunities uh, for moving it over the counter. Um, now just a quick show of hands, how many of you have purchased something over the counter drug? Okay. How many of you have purchased prescription drugs? Okay, so think in your own mind for those of you who raised your hands twice and imagine for those of you who only did it once or not at all, uh, the difference in the experience, uh, the time that was required, the price point at which the exchange took place and the involvement or lack thereof in insurance between the sorts of products that are purchasable over the counter versus those uh, that are prescription drugs, whether uh, branded or generic. Uh, the FDA, as Jeff alluded to at the very end, has switched a whole series of products over the course of the last four decades from uh, prescription only to over-the-counter. Uh, and in deciding whether or not to do that, the FDA uh, basically thinks about three distinct things. The ability of patients to properly self-diagnose without professional guidance, right? So you want to be careful about people uh, deciding they have malaria and treating themselves for it uh, with the drugs that are associated with the treatment of a particular condition. I pick malaria somewhat facetiously. The good news is it's not so common uh, here in the United States, but you treat it with antibiotics, and antibiotics has a series of uh, side effects, and you only want to take them when you need to. Um, so you want to make sure people actually are dealing with a problem that they can self-diagnose. And on that, I think, you know, opioids and naloxone, there's very little doubt that this is the sort of thing where people can properly self-diagnose without professional self-guidance. Second, the benefit-risk ratio of the drug that you're proposing to make over the counter. Um, to the extent the drug uh, has a narrow uh, benefit risk window, uh, you want to be careful about how broadly it's used. You want to reserve it for the situations where it's most appropriate. Um, and on this uh, criteria, I think naloxone actually fares quite straightforwardly uh, positive as well. Uh, we've got lots of experience with it being dispensed uh, by first responders uh, and also by members of the public who have taken advantage of the standing orders and the workarounds that the states have done. Finally is consumer friendly labeling uh, and as Jeff alluded to at the very end of his remarks, um, although in for other over-the-counter switches, we've basically waited for the company to come forward with a proposed label. Here the FDA has actually gone and done the work for them, uh, and they're more or less waiting for a company to step up and say, we'd like to manufacture this on an over-the-counter basis. Uh, over the past 30 or 40 years, we've seen switches uh, for drugs for pain, allergy, heartburn, and smoking cessation. And our experience with switches has actually, I think, been a, a clear and unambiguous win for consumers. They obtain drugs uh, and 
other products that they need uh, in a manner that's convenient and at a price that's substantially lower. They don't have to go see a doctor. They don't have to have a discussion. Uh, and so the question then uh, is if we switch to over-the-counter, uh, what are the possible uh, consequences that we ought to be concerned about? Uh, and to what extent are we most of the way there anyway with what's happened? Um, so part of the uh, distinction that's going to happen uh, if it's switched will be distribution. And uh, Jeff alluded to already the reality that um, we've had some difficulty pushing naloxone out as broadly uh, as we would like to, uh, given the fact that it's basically risk-free. Uh, and it's life-saving for people uh, who need it uh, and can get it on a real-time basis. So the reality is, you know, if you're selling a drug over the counter, you can sell it through about 750,000 different retail establishments. Uh, there are not 750,000 pharmacies in this country. Uh, the number is a lot closer to 40,000. Um, some of the bigger chains have decided to stock naloxone in every single store, um, but it's much more hit or miss. Uh, and even if they stock it, you're putting a burden on individuals to go and have a conversation with a pharmacist to get them to dispense the drug. Uh, and the price point at which it takes place uh, is uh, relatively steep as such things go. And so that, I think, has been an important barrier to adoption. The people who are pushing for over-the-counter treatment are hoping to make it much easier for people to get it in terms of the number of places they can go, the difficult conversations that they avoid, the reluctance of um, a reasonably significant number of pharmacists to be at least what they believe is complicit in drug abuse uh, and drug-seeking behavior, uh, as well as, you know, getting your insurance involved and uh, things like that. Um, so the question then is what's next? Well, I think the FDA um, has basically done far more to try and get naloxone to be publicly available uh, than it has done with anything else. And the reality is that the workarounds that the states have done have, should have, I think, satisfied everybody that naloxone is a drug that meets the requirements for switching, right? You don't have standing orders if you're worried about the margin of safety for the drug or the ability of patients to self-diagnose, right? So those sort of two preconditions have already been satisfied. Uh, and then the labeling, the FDA has done all of the work. So the difficulty here or the constraint is the willingness of a company to step forward uh, and offer the product. Now, the FDA has approved one generic provider of uh, a, a nasal spray uh, version of naloxone, but the, and that's Teva, I believe, uh, but they're in the midst of a patent infringement suit, uh, and so until that's sorted out, even though the FDA thinks that uh, it's appropriate uh, to have a generic available, and there are obviously good pricing reasons for uh, encouraging that, uh, until that's sorted out, we're not going to see that. And over-the-counter is going to run on a separate track. But in order for it to happen, we need a pharmaceutical company who wishes to step forward and manufacture the product, executing the paperwork. Even if the FDA unilaterally decides to reclassify it, it's still going to be dependent on someone being willing to do it or importing it or setting up a maverick company to do it, including the nonprofit that a variety of hospital chains have set up to do uh, drug uh, manufacturer as well. So that, I think, should give you a sense of the sort of regulatory framework and what the barriers are. And with that, we should have some time for questions. Thank you both for that. I think we have, uh, we have about 10, 12 minutes for Q&A, and I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Um, so if you would please uh, state your name and, and identify yourself, and uh, please keep your question in the form of a, of a question, if you would. I see a hand back here. Yes, gentlemen. Hi. My name is Marcus. Um, I'm, I guess you kind of alluded, to, sir, um, at, at the end. I was kind of curious about where the Cato Institute kind of stands, because I know they're big on the free market. Um, how, how you kind of square with wanting it to be more publicly available uh, through a over-the-counter, but also kind of maintaining, like I, you mentioned there was a patent on it, and I was wondering kind of how you would balance that out as to moving toward a more over-the-counter thing, but also considering that this has been something someone has, you know, created and the thing on that. First, first the, Cato, the Cato Institute per se doesn't have opinions. It, it's 
people who work there do. And so um, my opinion is that I, actually it's, it's in keeping with free markets and uh, limited government principles to reduce the regulatory burden on people getting naloxone. So if we could make it over the counter, that's, that's a good thing. That's a step in the right direction. Um, and, uh, you know, patent infringement is a, is a completely separate issue. The, 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 what I'm concerned about is making it, uh, removing the barriers to people who want to obtain this life-saving drug by having to go to a, a, a pharmacy and speak to a pharmacist who may or may not be willing to, to give it to them. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, so the only point I'd make is the drug itself is off patent and has been so for many years. One can patent a device to deliver the drug and you know there's no inconsistency between a belief in free markets and patent protection to encourage innovation. Um, but that's sort of not the relevant issue here and whether we switch it to over the counter or not. Another question? Uh, yes, gentlemen toward, yes. Hey, uh, my name's Robert. Uh, I work for a congressman who represents like rural Appalachia and Tennessee and I could see how this would be a um, policy proposal or something that would work better in like an urban area like everyone's now kind of got like Narcan with them and it's like oh I see this person on the side of the street like I can help them and has there been any success stories or any particular solutions to in more rural areas where that may not be the situation that arises how that problem is overcome well, well, by making it over the counter, as, as uh, David pointed out, now it's not just available in pharmacies. Now you could sell this at convenience stores, uh, uh, big box stores. So that should help actually get it to more remote areas. I, I'm from a state that outside of the, the two big cities is pretty, pretty rural and remote. And um, sometimes it could be quite a drive to a pharmacy, but it could be not nearly as far a drive to a convenience store. You could, I, could, I could see having them at uh, even at traffic rest stops on freeways. Anyone add anything to that? Or? Yeah, look, population density is going to affect access. It, this should not surprise you. It applies to all sorts of things, right? But uh, to the extent, echoing what Jeff just said, uh, it's more broadly available through, you know, 750,000 retail establishments. Uh, your odds go way up of whoever happens to be around having it in their pocket, um, even if there aren't nearly as many people wandering around as in Manhattan or any other major metropolitan area. Yes. Hello, I'm Dustin. I'm a Georgetown student. So, uh, so you guys mentioned the idea of moral hazard, and my question is that isn't it a bit difficult to declare unilaterally that moral hazard won't be an issue considering there isn't really enough data since the drug hasn't been available over the counter, like we're arguing for here? Well, I, I actually, that's, I, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I personally uh, kind of object to a moral hazard analysis of this issue, because like I said, if we go by moral hazard, almost, I would say in a modern affluent society like the United States, the great majority of what doctors do every day is practice harm reduction. When I have a person who uh, is overweight and has uh, mild diabetes and hypertension, and I know I can get that person to not require any medication if they just went on a diet and exercise program, but they don't want to. Um, I'm practicing harm reduction by prescribing medication for their diabetes and their hypertension because I basically decided if I can't stop you from engaging in a lifestyle that I think is doing you harm, let me at least try to reduce the harm. So it all depends on what your goal is. If your goal is that you want to force people to not engage in a behavior that you don't approve of, then you might be able to make a case that it's moral hazard. But if your goal is you want to see less overdose deaths, and the last I looked, that's what's upsetting everybody, the overdose death numbers, then moral hazard shouldn't even figure into the equation as far as I'm concerned. So I don't object to a moral hazard framing and an analysis. It's ultimately an empirical question how significant it is. I also teach insurance law, and we worry about moral hazard a lot in that context. Um, 
and I think it's actually something Congress should worry about more in many of the things that it does. Um, but in this area, the, the switch between our current approach with standing orders and it's available at every pharmacy that's willing to stock it versus over the counter, um, although it will uh, hopefully in fact the intended goal is to increase the availability of it um, I think we shouldn't worry so much about the moral hazard issue even if we accept that a moral hazard framing is useful relevant and maybe dispositive if the result uh, you know uh, let's just hypothetically assume because that's what law professors do we dramatically increase the number of people that are taking opioids because they're sense of the likelihood of rescue in the event the o they overdose is suddenly higher because they think other people are going to watch out for them. Maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. It's an empirical question. Um, but the switch between having this available in the way that we do currently versus over the counter is not a category change in that particular dynamic. And also but, uh, there's, as I mentioned during my presentation, there is at least one study, now granted that's just one study, uh, suggesting that in fact it did not lead to increased use, maybe even decreased use. Yes, young lady here in the green. Sorry, so you said, um, oh, thank you. So sorry, you said the problem was, or part of the problem is that manufacturing uh, companies aren't coming forward to try to provide this over the counter. Aside from, you said, like a cost difference in terms of over the counter and prescription, mm -hmm. is there any understanding for why they don't want to come forward to provide it over the counter? You take that one. Well, I, I think, you know, the incumbent provider's incentive to provide it is very different than the incentives of a new entrant, right? Because the incumbent providers have a business model that works for them. Uh, and if you look across time and across industries, people tend not to disrupt their own market. Uh, you require new entrants to do that. And so I think, you know, you, you can go and ask them and you can go ask the other companies why they're not doing it. Um, I don't want to speak for them or project onto them my own expectations or understandings. But certainly across time, you don't see people disrupting their own business model when it's working for them. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I see a hand up uh, there in the back of the room. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, as a formal medical student, um, I'm a little skeptical about removing uh, the process of healthcare delivery from a trained medical professional. And also, I can't help but wonder, um, companies that manufacture uh, naloxone and uh, drugs such as that, uh, how much would they fund groups such as the Cato Institute or groups such as that? Because uh, there seems to be a clear financial incentive to move from, uh, you know, um, a doctor, a trained medical professional pres prescribing a drug, moving it to OTC. Thank you. Um, so it turns out I have an entire book on the subject of how good a job uh, the trained medical professionals are doing at delivering high quality, low cost health care. Uh, the book's called Overcharged, Why Americans Pay Too Much for Health Care. Uh, published, guess, wait for it, by the Cato Institute. Um, and you can go to overchargeforhealthcare.com and read a couple of chapters for free. We're very charitable at the Cato Institute. Um, with regard to um, who's funding uh, the Cato Institute, um, I don't get a dime from the Cato Institute, and it's not obvious to me why uh, the, the, the argument that the, they have a conflict of interest uh, based on contributions from the current providers of naloxone works at all, okay? Um, if anything, uh, I would have expected a, a contributions from a different cohort of people. But as I said, I don't get it. I, I, I have these views for free as far as all of those people. Well, Georgetown pays me um, <laughs> handsomely as it happens. I have no complaints about yeah, that. I'd like to chime in also. Uh, I, understand, I appreciate you're a medical student. Well, uh, I'm a medical school graduate, and so is the Surgeon General, and so are many of the people at the CDC and the American Medical Association and the American Public Health Association. And I think I said the Surgeon General as well, and they are all saying this should be available widely for use without a doctor's uh, be supervision. And like I say, all the states now, you could, with this, between a standing order or pharmacist prescribing, 
people are just going up and getting it. You, you wouldn't see the sort of workarounds that we've seen if this were the sort of dynamic that's explainable in the terms that you framed the issue. Let me put it that way. Excellent. So I think that concludes part one of today's event. So let's give our two panelists a round of applause. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonjolyn Gamble. I come to you from the DC Department of Health. We are right down the street at 899 North Capitol. Um, I am the Harm Reduction and Hepatitis Program Manager. I have also brought along Shay Davis, who's our Special Populations Coordinator. And we're gonna talk to you today about our, um, I guess the epidemiology of op opioid overdoses here in the district, as well as community responses that we have going on in the district. And I know you guys might represent various jurisdictions, um, but I'm going to specifically speak about what's going on here in DC. So for the sake of time, we'll, you guys have the objectives listed here. I won't go through all of them. But in the beginning of the, the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about the pharmacology. And I know from the previous uh, presenters, you guys kind of went over how opioids work, um, how naloxone also works. And so we'll show a brief video clip that kind of illustrates that in a more simpler way. And um, we'll also go over some of the specific DC laws, codes, and regulations pertaining to naloxone administration. Um, as well as the Good Samaritan Law. So we get a lot of questions about how the Good Samaritan Law works and who is, who is covered under the Good Samaritan Law. Again, we'll talk about data, some statistics around fatal and non-fatal opioid overdoses here in DC. And then the most important parts at the end, we'll discuss how to actually administer Narcan. So just some background information. This is very basic, again. Um, when we talk about opioids or opiates, we know that uh, we are talking about things like heroin. A lot of people, especially here in DC, um, they are heroin users. So many people you might think of when you hear the term opiates or opioids, that folks are speaking of prescription drugs. However, in DC, we have a lot of heroin users. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands that heroin is also an opioid. So we also consider codeine, morphine, um, as well as opioids. Um, opioids are the most potent tools to relieve pain. Um, we know that a lot of doctors, healthcare prescribers, clinicians are doing a lot of prescribing. Um, looking at the data from 2012 to 2017, we know that opioid prescribing has gone down um, from those years. However, when you look at 2017 data, clinicians have prescribed over a quarter of a billion uh, different prescription opioids uh, during that year. So opioids may come in tablet or pill forms, capsule, powder, liquid forms. They can be smoked, snorted, injected, swallowed, or drank. And I just wanted to make a note here, going back to that first bullet point when we think about the poppy plant. So opioids and the poppy plant have been around from about 3400 BC, and the Sumerians um, used to call it the joy plant. So you just kind of think about that <laughs> a little bit. All right, and some background statistics here. Um, this is from the CDC, and this is from 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2015. We know that more than a half a million people die from drug overdoses, right? And so I like to say, um, by the time that this training is finished, we know that about four to five people will have died from an opioid overdose. Now, 115 people die every day from an opioid overdose. And again, this is 2016 data. This chart here is one that we usually show in our community, um, to our community members when we're doing these community-based trainings. On the left-hand side, you'll see a lot of the generic um, names of opioids in the middle, the trade name um, or the brand name, and then street names here. So a lot of folks, especially as we're working with the community, we start to kind of understand what folks are calling um, different opioids so that we know what to watch out for. So we, are, we work a lot with Metropolitan Police Department, Department of Forensic Sciences, and really understanding what different drugs are out there on the street and how they are terming those different drugs. So I specifically circled here fentanyl and carfentanil. Many of you have probably already heard of fentanyl and carfentanil. 
um, which is one of the fentanyl analogs. So when we think about fentanyl, um, a lot of cancer patients use fentanyl. Um, however, it's made its way into our drug market here. Um, we usually get questions during our training, folks asking, well, heroin has been around for a very long time here in DC, so why is it now that people are dying from opioid overdoses? Because we tend to have folks who have used for 20 or 30 years. Um, well, it's because of fentanyl. So fentanyl has kind of made its way into the drug supply here locally as well as nationally. And so folks, um, whether knowingly or unknowingly, are using fentanyl, <clears throat> and so thus leading to their deaths. And then with carfentanil, which is one of the fentanyl analogs, um, it's about 4,000 more times potent than that of heroin. So in the next slide, I'll kind of show you the lethality of each of those. So when you look at heroin versus fentanyl and carfentanil, you'll see that fentanyl on the, I'm sorry, carfentanil on the far, the far right, as little as a 20 microgram um, of carfentanil will lead to someone's death. And you can just kind of compare those across heroin and fentanyl. Um, some folks have probably heard in news media outlets um, around uh, first responders going onto the scenes and uh, kind of masking up and gearing up, trying to protect themselves from the exposure of fentanyl and carfentanil because they've heard that it's so powerful. Um, but I do want to dispel, dispel that myth um, because we do get this question pretty frequently around folks asking, well, hey, you know, is it true that if I just come into a room and I, in it, uh, I come into contact with it, I touch it, or I smell it, that I could potentially overdose. Um, we don't teach that. We don't want folks running away um, thinking that because they have been exposed in some kind of way or that it's airborne that they could potentially overdose. So that is not true. But you can see here across three of those pictures um, how potent carfentanil and lethal it is. So this video here um, will kind of piggyback off of what the presenter had mentioned earlier um, around opioid overdoses. So this will show you how opioids work, how naloxone kind of knocks that opioid off of its receptor to reverse the opioid overdose. Let's begin with understanding what an opioid overdose is and how it affects the body. Opioids work by interacting with receptors in our brain. The opioids fit into these receptor sites, sort of like a key fits in a lock. What makes opioids potentially so dangerous is that these same receptors ensure we keep breathing. An overdose happens when more and more opioid molecules latch onto these receptors, overwhelming the brain's ability to keep us breathing properly or even at all. Because someone suffering from an opioid overdose may appear to be simply sleeping, it's important to know the signs to look for. Specifically, breathing becomes very slow and shallow, erratic, or has stopped. Snoring or gurgling sounds are made. Pupils become pinpoints. There is a loss of consciousness. The person is unresponsive to outside stimulus. The body is limp. Pulses slow, erratic, or not there at all. The face is pale and clammy. Fingers and lips turn blue or purple, and the person may also experience vomiting. An opioid overdose deprives the body of oxygen, which can cause vital organs, especially the brain, to shut down. After three to five minutes without oxygen, brain damage starts to occur, soon followed by death. Fortunately, there is a medication that can temporarily combat opioid overdose symptoms, buying critical time for paramedics to arrive. Naloxone is a competitive antagonist to opioids. It works by knocking the opioids off the brain receptors they've latched onto, allowing the person to breathe again and temporarily reverses the overdose. So now we'll talk a little bit about risk factors for an opioid overdose. Um, a prior overdose is one of those. So we know that people who have a drug use pattern or history, that they are more likely to have a subsequent overdose. I know in DC, and I'll get to this slide once we start talking about epidemiology, but we tend to see a lot of repeat overdose cases in DC. Um, reduced tolerance, um, if a person has stopped using for some time, so let's say that they've entered substance abuse treatment or they were incarcerated, um, whatever they've done to kind of, um, I guess, discontinue their use um, also increases their risk for having a subsequent opioid overdose. Um, mixing drugs, um, a lot of things, again, that we learn out in the community. 
um, people will say, hey, I've learned that if I mix a stimulant and a depressant, that it kind of cancels each other out, so I'm less likely to overdose. Um, that is not true, and so we want people to be aware of that, um, that mixing drugs does increase your chances of um, having a subsequent opioid overdose as well. Using alone, um, we'll show a campaign at the end of this presentation, but obviously if a person uses alone, um, there's no one around to help resuscitate them um, or to use the naloxone or reverse them. So using alone um, is one of the campaign slogans um, that we've used in one of our um, past, I guess the past two years, one of the campaigns that we've had um, to kind of discourage people from using alone. And then lastly, um, increases in strength or quantity or ch changing formulations, and that's mostly related to prescription drug use. So when we're thinking about signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, um, again, just kind of thinking about the context is really important as well. So a lot of times people will say, hey, how do I determine whether or not someone has you know, if they're just high, if they've smoked marijuana versus someone who has actually had an opioid overdose. So these are just some of the signs and symptoms um, when you're thinking of someone being high versus someone having an overdose. So if you're high, your muscles tend to become a little bit more relaxed. Um, if you've overdosed, your skin is pale and clammy, so kind of sweaty. Um, your speech is slowed or slurred if you're high. Um, when you have overdose, again, very infrequent um, breathing or no breathing at all, whereas if you're high, of course, you're still breathing, right? Um, if you're high, you're responsive to stimuli. If you've overdosed, chances are if someone were to come up and call your name or shake you, you're probably not going to respond. Um, and again, you're going to have a very normal skin tone if you're high versus when you're overdosed, your skin tends to be a little bit more blue. Um, it, with, your lips will be blue and fingertips are blue as well. So the next four bullet points here on this slide um, talks a little bit about ways to prevent opioid overdoses. So one, we know um, is to improve opioid prescribing. So I think in 2016, um, this was the first time that the CDC actually issued guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. So prior to this, there were no federal um, guidelines around opioid prescribing. And this is really important for a lot of our primary care providers who didn't necessarily um, receive any of the extensive training around addictions, and so the CDC, again, issued these prescribing guidelines. Here at the D.C. Department of Health, um, we offer several uh, continuing education credits to providers, mainly uh, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera, um, so that they can get free CEs around opioid prescribing. Uh, preventing opioid use disorder, PDMP, most people have probably heard of PDMP or the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program which is essentially a database that was developed, it's fairly recent, um, it was developed just a few years ago. And what this database does is allows providers to input patient um, information, so their, um, their, their prescriptions. So for instance, if I'm a physician, I'm going to enter whenever I give John Doe oxycodone, so that the next time that a provider sees this patient, he too can go into the PDMP database to see the patient's history around prescribing. Now, unfortunately, um, a lot of states are not sharing data. There's some work to get uh, states and jurisdictions to share this type of data, because obviously in places like D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, where we're so close, someone could doctor shop, obviously. You know, if I'm in D.C., I could get over to Maryland in 15 minutes and have a doctor to write a prescription, and if states aren't sharing data, then there's no way for that doctor to see, hey, John Doe just got this opioid prescription 15 minutes ago. So some of the formulary management strategies and in insurance programs, so that really speaks to prior authorizations. So a lot of healthcare um, insurance companies institute prior authorizations um, before they prescribe or pay for opioid prescribing or prescriptions. So you would have to call your insurance company in order to get that authorized for them to pay for that. Um, a lot of academic detailing um, has started to happen with opioid prescribing. So with academic detailing, it's really kind of set up on a pharmaceutical model. You know, you have detailers who will go out, a lot of clinical case consultants really go out to speak to doctors and say, hey, you know, educate them on new opioids and the proper guidelines around prescribing. And then treating opioid use disorder. Um, in the district, we've really started to kind of get away from methadone prescribing and methadone clinics and going into the gold standard of MAT um, with buprenorphine and naltrexone. 
Um, so at the DC Department of Health, we fund uh, eight providers who are now, um, we have about, let's see, 9D data wave prescribers um, in eight of our FQHCs and community-based organizations, and they're now able to prescribe buprenorphine. And then lastly, reversing overdoses. So I think earlier someone spoke about standing orders. Um, and though this says standing orders at pharmacies, I'll just say, in the district, we don't have a jurisdiction-wide standing order. So unlike Maryland and Virginia, where if you can go, you can go into any pharmacy in, in Maryland and Virginia and ask for naloxone over the counter. However, I'm sorry, at the pharmacy. However, in DC, there are only certain pharmacies who have standing orders. Now, when I mention a standing order, it's essentially, I like to call it a blanket prescription. So a blanket prescription that covers folks so that they don't have to have an individual prescription from their primary care provider or from their provider um, to go into a pharmacy to get uh, naloxone. So um, again, in the district, um, we issued a policy statement in December 2018 um, where we first piloted eight pharmacies and gave them a standing order under our chief medical officer. And then just as recent as August 31st, we've expanded that partnership to include eight different pharmacies. Um, we also have distribution through local community-based organizations or what we call CBOs. So we work with a lot of um, CBOs throughout the district. If you're familiar with HIPS, Family and Medical Counseling Services, Bread for the City, etc. Those are some of the agencies that we tend to work with and they go out and distribute um, naloxone in drug use, um, high drug use areas. So if you've kind of driven down North Capitol and let's say New York Avenue, You'll see a lot of people hanging out using drugs. We tend to get a lot of drug overdose calls in those areas, too. All right. So naloxone um, is a generic name, and then Narcan, again, is a brand name of the drug. It is FDA approved. Um, it reverses the opioid overdose. There are several different routes of administration, intranasal, intramuscular, and intravenous. Now, these routes of administration are only for the generic naloxone, right? So when I say Narcan, I'm specifically talking about the intranasal version. Um, there's also no potential for abuse when using Narcan. And along those same lines, if let's say that you mistake someone for having an opioid overdose and they actu actually just had a seizure um, or some diabetic attack, then you could still, let's say you weren't able to really distinguish between those two and then you, you proceeded to use nasal Narcan spray, Nothing's going to happen to that individual if you've incorrectly diagnosed them. So I always like to say better safe than sorry. And especially as we know the context of the situation. So sometimes I like to share a story when I tend to walk from our 899 North Capitol office down to our 77 P Street location. Again, it's a very high drug use area. Um, and I ran into a gentleman who was kind of passed out on the sidewalk. Now, I didn't know if he was simply sleeping or if he had had an overdose. So thinking about this area being a really high drug use area, I'm like, okay, I carry my naloxone in my backpack every day. So I was prepared. So I went over to the gentleman and I shook him and I said, sir, sir. And he kind of woke up, you know, very slowly. So at that point, that was my way to really assess if he was still conscious or not. And so I didn't have to proceed um, to using that naloxone. However, had that gentleman not responded, then I probably would have, or I would have proceeded to use my naloxone, especially knowing that area. So that's why I always say it's really important to take into the context. Like if you know that this person um, might be, you know, have a history of drug use or friends and family um, has a history, then I would say better safe than sorry in that case. So going back to some of the formulations again, um, to the far left, again, that's the Narcan nasal spray. Uh, the second one is the, I, I'm sorry, it's still an intranasal spray, however, it uses an atomizer. Um, so it requires a little assembly. And then the FZO is an IM or intramuscular version. I think someone was talking about that earlier. Now, when those hit the market, they were very expensive, and they still are very expensive. The last time I checked, they're about $1,300 per kit, and we pay $75 per kit for the nasal Narcan spray here. Um, and then at the end is another IM version, and so <clears throat> the DC Department of Health, we support the Narcan nasal spray. It's just very simple to use, um, whereas these versions at the end, 
comes with a vial, you have to use a syringe. And if you're not really familiar with assembling that or using a syringe, um, then you, that would take some time away from actually responding to the crisis. Now, going a little bit into specific laws and statutes associated with naloxone administration. I'll go into that. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about the history of naloxone access and how we kind of got to where we are today. So in 1996, the first take-home naloxone program started in Chicago, um, the Chicago Recovery Alliance. In 95, their executive director passed away from a heroin overdose. And so with a lot of advocacy efforts, they then instituted their first take-home naloxone. And when you hear folks say first, uh, the take-home naloxone program or take-home naloxone, that's essentially what we're doing here today, what a lot of jurisdictions are doing, where you don't have to go to a pharmacy um, or a clinical setting or a medical setting to retrieve naloxone. You can actually just get it from a CBO provider, take it home with you without any prescriptions. And then in 2001, the first naloxone access law was implemented in New Mexico. And 2006, we speak about Project Lazarus in North Carolina. Um, a lot of the work that we do at the DC Department of Health really revolves around the work that was instituted here in North Carolina because we do a lot of comprehensive harm reduction and risk reduction programs. So HIV testing, hepatitis C testing and treatment, and then a lot of, again, harm reduction programs where we have wound care, syringe services programs, so a lot of jurisdictions, again, we modeled our programs after Project Lazarus went through this really extensive evaluation period, was sought to be successful, and so again, we modeled um, a lot of our programs after that. Then, as of July 15, 2017, all 50 states have some form of naloxone access law, and as of that same date, 40 states have passed an overdose good Samaritan law. So the Substance Abuse and Opioid Overdose Prevention Amendment Act of 2018. Um, this was first implemented, I think, in 2016. It was recently updated, <clears throat> I think, uh, 2019. Uh, an, an amendment happened in 2019 that's being finalized as well. So this simply states, an employee or volunteer of a community-based organization shall not dispense or distribute an opioid antagonist, i.e. naloxone, um, under this section unless he or she completes training conducted by the Department of Health. Now, this really applies to a lot of our community-based organizations in doing their work in distributing naloxone because we want folks, one, to be um, aware that naloxone is take-home at this point, um, understanding orders, and then two, folks need to be trained on how to use naloxone um, before kind of going out into the community. Now, you don't have to go through an extensive training that we do at the Department of Health. A lot of our CBOs really go through a quick and dirty five-minute training with um, some of the folks who are coming to retrieve naloxone. But this law, in a sense, kind of establishes the Department of Health as the authority um, in providing the training to district residents and CBOs. So is Narcan legal to carry? Yes. Narcan is legal to carry. Um, I won't um, read all of the verbiage here. You can read that. But I, <clears throat> excuse me, I will highlight the three bullet points at the end. So one. This law protects you as long as you, are, you reasonably believe that someone is having an overdose and you are treating that person based on that, right? And then number two, Narcan is legal to carry outside of a hospital or medical office setting. So going back to that take home naloxone access policy. And then number three, without the expectation of receiving or intending to seek compensation for such services and acts. So number three really gets at now, we have a lot of different partnerships um, throughout the district, and a lot of people don't feel comfortable administering Narcan. So employers can't mandate that you respond to an opioid overdose or that you administer Narcan. Um, so this law really protects those folks who are not wanting to do that, and then their employers also cannot enforce that they do that. So you can't be receiving compensation, in a sense, to administer Narcan. And then the Good Samaritan Law. I hope a lot of folks have heard about the Good Samaritan Law um, at this point. Um, so it was passed by city council and signed in 2013. Um, and essentially what the Good Samaritan Law is incentivizes people to call 911. So what we hear a lot in the community is that people, you know, what they call trap houses. I'm not sure if you've heard of that term. Trap houses or secondary needle exchanges. Um, people, <clears throat> excuse me, people will go there. There's all types of drug paraphernalia around. Let's say someone overdoses. 
People are afraid to call 911 because if I call 911, chances are police are coming. Well, we want to avoid folks not calling 911 and someone dying because they thought, hey, if I had drugs around or because this person overdosed, then I would get arrested. So the Good Samaritan law really protects those individuals. So any witnesses on the scene, um, even the overdose victim, this law protects those persons. So the police can't lock you up. They can't incarcerate you. Um, they can't go in trying to investigate to see what type of drugs are on the scene. So again, we really want our community members to be aware of the Good Samaritan law so that they call 911 the next time that they are on the scene of an overdose. Um, this is one of the most recently uh, enacted laws. So con the Controlled Substance Testing Emergency Amendment Act of 2018. Now this goes back to December of 2017 where it was emergency legislation um, because we were again starting to see a lot of fentanyl overdose cases, fatal fentanyl overdose cases here in the district. Um, I think this might have just been made permanent um, in May, but I will double check <clears throat> this. So essentially what this amendment act does is protect those individuals and CBOs from some of the previous drug paraphernalia laws. So in 1982, Sorry, prior to 2017, so from 1982 to 2017, if persons had drug testing paraphernalia equipment on them, then they could be arrested. Um, however, with the, the um, I guess, once fentanyl testing strips really came about, um, folks wanted to be able to test their drugs to see if fentanyl was present in their drugs. And so this, this law here says that it permits CBOs to deliver or sell possessed with intent to deliver or sell testing equipment or other objects used, intended for use, or designed for use for that same purpose, which, again, goes back to testing equipment or analyzing drugs. So if people, if you look at that, um, the picture to the right here, it kind of looks like a pregnancy test. So if you put that into your works, what we call it, or your drug supply, um, if you see uh, one line, you'll get one line or two lines. One line is positive, yes, one line is positive, and then two lines negative. So that pretty much just shows if fentanyl is present in your drug supply. And again, this, this amendment act protects those people who might have these fentanyl testing strips on their person. So going a little bit over the epidemiology, and this is a, very interesting, at least to me it is, um, when we talk about numbers and data um, and how it, the epidemic really looks here in the district. So I should update this because I think it still says four. It does, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so D.C. is actually now third um, in the U.S. for opioid overdose deaths, and that is behind, number one is Ohio, I'm sorry, number one is West Virginia, and number two is Ohio, and then number three is now D.C. So when we look at our average overdose patient in D.C., we know that they're about 54 years of age, um, which is much higher than that of the national average. Um, I like to always say that D.C. has a very different demographic from the rest of the country. Most of our opioid fatalities are older black men, whereas when you look at in other jurisdictions, it's mostly a rural or suburban white user. Um, most of the overdose patients in DC, they reside in wards five, seven, and eight. 83% most are African American, and then also most are also male. So FEMS transport encounter. So this goes over about a year and a half worth of data. Um, this is from January 2018 to May of 2019. Um, so we see that there are some trends here, right, if you follow that blue line. We tend to see a lot of overdose cases happening throughout the summer. So they spike in the summer, and then as, as time goes on or as it gets colder, um, overdose deaths go down. We know folks out in the summertime are, like, partying, having a good time, <laughs> and then usually, again, once the weather breaks, people will kind of go back into their homes. All right, and so this is not, I'm sorry, this is fatal data. So this is from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner's Office, and it represents data from 2014 to 2018. So we know from 14 to 2017, there was about a 238% increase in opioid overdoses. So if you look at 2014 to the far left, you see that we had 83 deaths or fatalities related to opioids. In 2015, 114 deaths. In 2016, we had 231 deaths. 
2017 is the year that we had the most, 279 deaths. And then it declined some in 2013. So we, I'm sorry, in 2018. So we had about a 30% decrease um, from 2017 to 2018. And we would really like to attribute that to a lot of our community-based naloxone distribution programs and MAT programs that we've had since, that we've implemented since then. All right, and then when we look at some of the different um, fentanyl analogs and different drugs that are actually causing opioid overdose deaths, we can see that there's mainly two different drugs in DC that are causing most of our deaths. And so that's fentanyl and heroin. Now again, I'll make the, the distinguish between DC and a lot of other jurisdictions. Now if you look at the very end, at prescription opioids, you'll see we have some, but keep in mind that these are not mutually exclusive data or cases. So a lot of times what we see in DC is that someone may have used heroin with their prescription opioids. It's never really a prescription only, I'm sorry, prescription opioid only death. All right, and then this data again mirrors that of non-fatal overdoses. So again, about 80% of our deaths in DC fall between the 40 and the 69 age group, um, with most of those folks falling in between the 50 and 59. And then race ethnicity, again, this mirrors that of non-fatal, it's mostly black. And then when we look at resident status, again, we'll see, again, this is from the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. So these are folks who have actually passed away or died in DC. So we are only tracking those cases. So most of those are DC uh, fatalities for people who are living in DC. We have some Maryland, so essentially what that means is people who are living in other jurisdictions like Maryland and or Virginia, they come to DC, they cop their drugs here, they die here. So we have to report that um, through our OCME office. And then other, again, remember I mentioned those other states that are close by where we tend to see folks coming in to cop their drugs and they die here. So, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. So that other category really represents some of those people who are coming from nearby jurisdictions. And then undomiciled is our homeless population. Um, that number is actually increasing. We're beginning to see a lot of um, opioid-related fatalities amongst our homeless population. And then unknown is simply we don't know their residency status. And then this again mirrors that of the non-fatal data. So mostly wards five, seven, and eight are where folks are living who are passing away from opioids. So this slide I really like to incorporate um, just so folks can kind of really get an idea of what's going on here in DC. 90-day um, repeat overdoses. Now this is from January through March of 2019. Um, so we took a snapshot of about nine, I'm sorry, 375 patients. And these are all repeat cases. Remember in the beginning I talked about how DC FEMS, our Fire and Emergency Medical Services, really go out and they really know a lot of folks by name. These are people who have had multiple episodes of opioid overdoses. Um, so we looked at 375 patients and amongst those folks, they had a total of 940 overdoses. So that averaged about two and a half overdoses per patient. And that ranges from two to 10. Now we collect a lot of data from our CBO providers um, and they also, I'm sorry, they're able to report to us how many, um, how many naloxone kits or doses that they've used on, an, on a survivor. Um, and so many times we see things from like five or six different Narcan uh, doses that have been administered because people are just really using drugs that they don't know what's in it um, and they end up here, represented here because you can see again, the range of two overdoses to 10, there's an average of six months between events. I actually just looked at our data on yesterday just to kind of see what was going on. And yesterday afternoon, I guess that was maybe around three o'clock, we had already had um, 10 overdoses. And then one gentleman had, this was his third overdose in two weeks. So we tend to see a lot of those repeat overdoses here in the district. And again, most of them are male. So one, we hear a lot about people putting someone in a bathtub, ice bath, 
or putting ice in their underwear or bodily orifices. And so people think that that is supposed to somehow like wake them up. Um, and we teach them not to do that because it can really depress your body, your core body temperature. And once you do that, the person could actually go into um, further overdose. Um, don't try to stimulate the person in a way that could cause harm. So again, we hear, hey, you know, again, back in the... <laughs> Back in the early 90s or in 2000s when I was, you know, running the streets and before naloxone was available, we all just got in a circle and we kicked and we punched and he woke up and that worked. Um, again, we're using scientific evidence-based practices is what I like to say. So we have access to naloxone so we don't have to get in circles and kick people and punch them to try to wake them up from an opioid overdose. And then lastly, you don't want to inject them with the foreign substance. We hear this one pretty often too. So folks think that, hey, if I inject, if I take my needle and inject them with milk, um, that will reverse their opioid overdose. Again, these are all myths. Um, you don't want to force someone to drink anything, force them to eat anything, um, inject any foreign substances in them either. Um, we know a lot of times people who inject drugs, they tend to get abscesses and endocarditis. And so being, uh, doing these things will actually increase their chances of getting those bacterial infections. So what do you do in the case of an opioid overdose? One, you're going to assess for responsiveness and breathing. Um, remember I talked about that walk that I take along um, North Capitol. So that's kind of what I did with that gentleman. I called his name, shook his shoulder. That takes all of three seconds to assess someone for their responsiveness and breathing. Um, secondly, calling 911 and saying, hey, my friend or my family member is unresponsive, I need help. So that's really important. We have to make sure that folks know to call 911. It's not just okay to administer the Narcan and, and not get the person further medical treatment. Number three, rescue breathing to provide oxygen. So rescue breathing is the quickest way to get oxygen back into the body. And then the rescue breathing step is only performed if the person is not already breathing on their own. Um, and then administering Narcan. So when you're administering Narcan to a person, they should be lying on their backs. Um, you're gonna insert the nozzle into their nose. Shay will kind of show you guys the nozzle here. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm sorry, the simulator. So this is a Narcan simulator. Um, it's very easy to use. Everyone will get um, a kit today, but the, the Narcan nozzle I'll show but if you can see here, it has this little nozzle um, here. And this is, I like to tell folks, it's, it's very simple to use. It's not hard at all. Um, this is the only thing that you would do is push this all the way up a person's nostril, and there it goes. So again, um, one thing I like to mention is the half-life of Narcan. So the half-life of Narcan is about 30 to 90 minutes. And I say that because when we think about our average heroin user here, we know that heroin really metabolizes through the body quickly. It's one of the, the only drugs that metabolizes as quickly as it does. However, it can take up to about six hours for a heroin to really get out of your, or I'm sorry, to, it stays active in your system for about six hours. Now, the reason I say that is because the half-life of Narcan is so short. So if the half-life is only 30 to 90 minutes of Narcan, and then we're thinking about someone who is using heroin, um, and that's potentially staying in their body for up to six hours, someone could go into another overdose um, after you've used that initial spray of Narcan. So it's really important to stay with that person to make sure that they don't go into another overdose. Um, and then if there's no response after you've administered that first dose, then you're gonna give them the second dose after three minutes. Now the Narcan nasal sprays that we're handing out today comes with two doses. The last step is placing a person in the recovery position. And I'll go through a little bit more detail on the subsequent slides. Um, so assessing for responsiveness and breathing, I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. So again, um, if you don't, uh, shake the person or call their name. One other option is to do the sternum rub. So if you take your fist, if everyone takes their uh, fist here, and then rub it very aggressively up and down your sternum. It hurts, it's really uncomfortable. So if a person doesn't respond, that's one way to really assess. If a person doesn't respond to that, and again, considering the context of the situation and the person might have overdosed. The rescue breathing steps. Now we do teach rescue breathing. 
Um, so again, these are pretty much the same steps, or the person would be laying the same way for rescue breathing as you would have them for Narcan, in a sense. So the person's gonna be laying on his or her back, their nose is pinched, you're gonna give two slow breaths, and then one breath every five seconds. Every five seconds, you're gonna continue to perform that rescue breathing until the person has started breathing on their own. And again, I just wanna make a note too. So this is a graphical representation of how rescue breathing looks. Um, one thing that we do say, again, if you're like walking down the street and you run into someone, and you're like, okay, that's a stranger. I only, I only have my naloxone. I don't feel comfortable performing the rescue breathing. <clears throat> then don't perform it. Um, we want you to feel comfortable, but what's most important is the use of that naloxone spray. Um, I say, or I guess maybe a year ago, we started incorporating the rescue breathing piece after our health department director went to um, one of the safe injection sites in Vancouver, and then she was able to really talk to the medical providers there, and they were to, you know, they told her, hey, you know, that we can always tell when a person comes into the emergency department and know if that person has had rescue breathing performed on them, because if they don't, then their brains really looked like mush. So at that point, we really started to teach the rescue breathing piece. Um, at the DC Department of Health, we're gonna be putting together some uh, overdose prevention kits. We'll include some face shields. Um, communities have, our community members have been asking for those. And then this last step here is the recovery position. So again, after the person has started breathing on their own, you've already administered the Narcan, this is the last step here, the recovery position. The person should be in the recovery position waiting for EMS to arrive. Now their bent knee is going to support their body. Their hands are under their face. <clears throat> and who knows, does anyone know um, why the hand is under the head? Can't hear? So, okay. <laughs> So we want to make sure that our hand supports our head because a lot of times in overdoses, people will vomit. Um, and you want to prevent them from vomiting on themselves and then they choke on it and then die. So we try to make sure that their hand is supporting their head so that they're not essentially dying from vomit on their own vomit. So again, as a reminder, <coughs> so two cases that require a second dose of Narcan, if the person has not responded to the initial one after three minutes, Secondly, if the person has relapsed into an overdose again after recovering from the first one, because remember we talked about the half-life. Naloxone only works for about 30 to 90 minutes, whereas someone's heroin could be in their body for up to six hours. So following up after an overdose, you want to explain what happened, advise against using any drugs for now. I like to say people are going to make their own decisions. We know that people are autonomous individuals, and people are going to do what they want to do. So I say advise them from using any drugs from now because we don't want them to land in those statistics that we talked about earlier with all of those repeat overdoses. So we know that if, and we see this pretty often too with some of our FEMS data, people will overdose, they refuse to go to the emergency department, and then four hours later, FEMS is back out there responding to them again because they've had another overdose four hours later. So if EMS is not present, um, you want to take the person to the emergency room for whatever reason, if you're not able to get them, um, get them into an ambulance and stay with them until after the naloxone has fully worn off. All right. So these are just a couple of pointers. Uh, most individuals will recover after a single dose, but remember I talked about our CBOs and how sometimes they will see um, they will have to use three, four, five doses of Narcan, but most times people will recover after a single dose. Um, and then one point to also make, <clears throat> while we teach all of these steps, going through the rescue, breathing, recovery position, what we hear in the field most times, once you've used that uh, naloxone or administer it, people are going to hop right up. So a lot of times you don't have to necessarily go through those steps because after that dose of it, naloxone is administered, the person is hopping up anyway. Um, so the person will be in withdrawal because naloxone works very quickly to try to pump those drugs out of our system. So we do hear that people will wake up and they are violent, they are aggressive, they are fighting, they are wondering why did you save my life? Why did you make me waste my money on my drugs? All of these things we hear. 
Um, so in this case, the, the rescuer needs to take precautions or keep in mind your own safety as you are responding to someone who has had an overdose. All right, and then these are just some of our community response efforts that are going on now. Um, we'll talk, or we talked a little bit about the posters or the campaigns um, that DBH has out. D DBH is the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, and so it says the times have changed how you use should to don't use alone, don't use without naloxone, it could save a life. Um, and then we have the DBH access line number at the bottom where folks can get linked to different treatment resources. So this kind of goes back to those risk factors that we talked about, um, not using alone, don't use without someone. Again, people won't, no one's around to save your life. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that message was clear to people. So how do I get naloxone? Ask. <laughs> So one thing we want to make sure that folks know, aside from getting free Narcan that's available at the health department, um, primary care physicians, any physician with, I'm sorry, any prescriber um, or who has prescribing authority can write you a prescription for naloxone. So that includes your NP, uh, PA, et cetera. They can write prescriptions for naloxone. Um, DC Medicaid also covers naloxone. I think there's a dollar copay for people who are wanting um, naloxone that is covered under DC Medicaid. Um, all prior authorizations have also been waived, and then there's no limit on the number of naloxone uh, prescriptions that you can get under your insurance. So these are three of our funded providers. Again, I mentioned FMCS, Bread for the City, and HIPS. Um, these are CBO partners where you can essentially just walk in, uh, walk into their, their offices and retrieve naloxone for free. And then this last video is a demonstration of Narcan. Now this is one that we use um, from our manufacturer, um, which they acts that we use. Um, although it's, it, it goes against a little bit what we teach here at the health department. So you can just kind of pay attention to it. These are the most important steps, I will say. If you encounter someone who is unresponsive and you suspect an overdose, first shake their shoulders and shout their name. Kevin. Ask if he or she is okay. Hey, can you Check for signs of an overdose. Unresponsive to touch or voice. Breathing is slow, uneven, or has stopped. <sighs> Snoring, gasping, or gurgling sounds. Fingernails or lips are blue or purple. Administer Narcan nasal spray as quickly as possible if someone is unresponsive and an opioid overdose is suspected, even when in doubt, because prolonged respiratory depression may result in damage to the central nervous system or even death. Lay the person on their back to receive a dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove Narcan nasal spray from the box. Peel back the tab with the circle to open it. Remove and review the printed quick start guide inside the package. Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Do not press the plunger to test or prime the device. If you do, you will waste all or part of the dose of medication. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under the neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the full dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove the device from the nostril after giving the dose. After you have given this medication, seek emergency help right away. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. I'm with somebody who stopped breathing. I, I think they've had an overdose. Move the person on their side after giving Narcan nasal spray. If possible, put their hands under their head and bend their upper leg forward. This helps prevent the person from rolling onto their stomach. This is known as the recovery position. Continue to watch the person closely. If they do not wake up or respond to your voice or touch, or if they do not seem to be breathing normally within two to three minutes, use a new Narcan nasal spray to give an additional dose in the other nostril. All righty. So that's pretty much a very simple demonstration of uh, Narcan administration. Um, the one thing that I usually tell folks um, during our trainings, um, one, 
since this is very simple to use, there's really not a need to open the package to read the instructions. That takes a little bit of time away from um, trying to save someone's life. And then also in this video, the lady called 911 after she had already started. Um, so we wanna make sure that after she had started administering Narcan. So the one thing we wanna make sure that we emphasize is that uh, call 911 in the very beginning. So remember, you'll do the assessment for the responsiveness and breathing. That should take all of three or four seconds um, to quickly do a sternum rub or check a pulse um, and then proceed to calling 911. So in that way, we know that fire and emergency medical services will be on the way um, while you are tending to the overdose victim. All right, any questions? Everyone's ready to go out and administer Narcan. <laughs> yes. You mentioned like there are some particular wards that have like a higher, mm -hmm. like I know at least for myself, I'm new to DC. Can you describe for me like where that area is? Sure. So Ward 5, I'm not sure if you go down, that's mostly, it's still east of the river too, um, but Ward 5 is around H Street. Um, you have probably gone down H Street at this point. So H Street going into Benning Road, um, also where the new, it's called Heckinger Mall, I'm not sure if you know where that is. But also going down New York Avenue where that new like Nike outlet and all of those places are, that's West Virginia Avenue, that's Ward 5. Um, east of the river is what we call Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, and that's like Martin Luther King, if you've heard of the big chair um, in DC, that's Ward 8. Um, but again, these are areas that are heavily populated by African, largely populated by African Americans. Um, and these are the same wards that we see a lot of different um, health disparities, right? Because we know that these areas are occupied largely, again, by African Americans, it's low income. Um, low educational attainment. So it just kind of really aligns with all of those kind of markers of disparities in health that we see. I do that? Yeah, I recommend that people have those on hand and we actually brought some here for everyone today. So if you wanna keep those on your person or if you wanna have them in your different congressional offices, then that's up to you and the, I guess some of the staffers. Um, it's kind of up to you and how you uh, really disseminate those. But everyone will get a free kit today and then if you wanna reach out to myself or Shay Davis um, to grab some more of those, then we are open um, to that idea as well. We carry every day. So. so after a person wakes up from a Narcan, um, do you still suggest they go to the hospital? Okay. Yes, I definitely still recommend someone getting emergency medical treatment. So again, um, we don't like, we tend to see this, um, when fire and EMS goes out, we have, a, we know in DC about 34% of people refuse further treatment. Um, and that means declining the ambulance ride to the emergency department. It's up to them, but it's recommended that you take that person to the hospital just to make sure everything is okay with them. Yeah. Uh before I go around just dropping Narcan into people's noses, I want to uh, just kind of get a clarity of what non-responsive means. Does it mean minimally responsive? Are there degrees or is it absolutely out cold? Yeah, out cold. And I think we had this question on yesterday. Someone was asking, well, if the person, if how do they say? Like, like, if you touch them and they go like this, you know, to like get you to stop touching them, they're responding. If they're right. responding to you in any way, then try to get them awake a little bit to start moving around or talking to you, start trying to talk to them. Um, yeah, that's what yeah. we would do. But don't give them Narcan, because they're, if they're responding to you, they're gonna be mad. <laughs> they're gonna they're be also mad. gonna be mad when they are not responding and they wake up and realize their yeah. high is gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, yeah. But yeah, so completely non-responsive. Uh, 
Um, can you talk a bit more about access to Narcan, apart from us in the room receiving this right now? Like, it was mentioned that you can go to ask for a prescription. Can anyone do that? Do you have to show that you have some form of addiction or anything? Or can anyone just go and ask for a form of prescription? Yeah, so in the district, naloxone is pretty uh, readily accessible and available to anyone, um, regardless of any addictions that you may have. Um, naloxone is available at about 20 of our community-based providers. Those three that I showed at the end, uh, FMCS, which is Family and Medical Counseling Services, they're in Ward 8. Um, HIPS, which is off of 8th Street, and then Bradford, the city is in the Shaw community. Um, those are three of our funded partners, and you can just walk in and grab Narcan from those places. And then going back to our pharmacy pilot that just started on August 31st, um, I can, well, it's on the website. Um, you can actually just do a quick Google search um, to see those, the listings of the 17 pharmacies um, that are participating in this pilot. So if you go into any of those 17 uh, pharmacies, you don't have to have a prescription. They don't ask your name. You don't have to give them any insurance card. You can just simply say, hey, I want a free Narcan kit. And then they'll give you free Narcan. So I actually moved here two months ago from, uh, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and I worked um, statewide for the Department of Mental Health. And each state has different, like, you guys all know this. So I would look into what your laws are regarding the lock zone because it's different per jurisdiction. So like our Medicaid access was different than it is here in Tennessee, just, or in DC, excuse me. Any other questions? All right, thank you. And we will uh, put these Narcan kits up here on the table for folks to grab and feel free to, I think I brought, I pretty much brought enough for everyone. So if you want to take two, then you can probably do that too. <laughs>